Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. I'm very excited for this interview. Today with me, I have Erica Williams from Austin, Texas. Erica, thank you so much for joining the show. I really appreciate it. For sure. Thank you for letting me on today. Definitely, definitely. So first, could you just give us an overview of who you are and what you do? So the shortest one I do is a military kid, lived in Alaska, lived in several different states, uh, came to Texas on a coin flip. I was either going to go to Nashville, Tennessee, or I was going to go to Austin, Texas. And this is after I didn't get married to somebody. I was like, I'm changing, I'm moving. <laughs> and uh, you know how those things go. So I get out here and I just see nothing but opportunity. And so I just kind of, um, I work in apartment management and then I was delivering pizzas at night and I just learned so much of the area delivering pizzas, right? So then I uh, started just working on somewhat of a side hustle and I ended up going, once I learned as a billings manager what was going on in painting, I hopped and made a painting company with my friend, made a lot of money off that, um, sold that and eventually got to trucking. So some people will be like, man, you do a lot of stuff. And I go, no, nah, I do really hyper-focused projects one thing at a time. So Definitely, definitely. Um, and can you tell us more about what your childhood was like and what you saw or even what you didn't see that shaped your view of what it means to build well? For sure. Um, I would say my mom, <clears throat> my mom being in the military 26 years, my dad did 10 years. Uh, we got to live in some cool places, Alaska, some other cool, uh, I had a lot of Korean friends. It was weird. I just had like 12 Korean friends. I was like in a pack of Koreans mm -hmm. as a kid. And <laughs> just because the military towns are so diverse. Um, and then my brother had Germany, he got to live in Germany as a kid. But uh, overall, I got this experience from our family in the 1980s that, hey, we went bust, we don't have any money. Everybody, let's go at one time and do something. So you had all these family members in the military, somebody was in nursing, somebody was doing this. And it was a very much collective push uh, incentivized by our grandma. So it was good. Um, my first job at 14 was my cousin's dollar store. Now here's the, th here's the kicker. This wasn't some franchise dollar store. This was literally him back in the day when you had to order out of a catalog, wait for it to ship from China and started his own dollar store. Wow. And to this day, I was like, man, you can do anything. You, you really can. You know, my grandpa had a juke joint and a farm. So it's like, <laughs> you can have a business, you can start whatever you want on the side, opportunities out there. Got it, got it. So it seems like one thing you learned growing up is that you know, anything is possible, you know, particularly from seeing different family members going through different businesses. And I'm sure mm -hmm. it had an impact on you as you grew into your career and your own businesses. Yeah. I mean, you, you basically, you get to work and you go, I don't particularly like how these people are talking to me. I don't, or, or I knew, you know, you're an entrepreneur when you're always at work trying to give them a shortcut or a smarter ideal or, Hey, let's do this. And it's quicker and more efficient. Uh, no, just do it the way we tell you to do it. Right. It's eating up time. And, and what I noticed is when I had a business, I had a brick and mortar coffee shop across from a college. And when it closed because of construction on the road and a few other things, and I went to Texas, I would go in businesses and people had been doing something the same way forever. Super inefficient, super, you know, time consuming. But it was almost like when you're creating a job for employees, you're just trying to have filler time. I had the mindset of a, a business owner where I'm like, let's, let's cut it down. What are we doing? This is goofing off. Um, and so that was some of the best part of coming to Texas. I got to see both sides of like how people run corporate, corporate America and how I can do it better. For sure. For sure. And, and you mentioned that you came to Texas on a coin flip. So can, you, can you talk to us more about that? Yeah. So I came out <laughs> here with a friend and we went to uh, spring break and we had spring break in Austin, Texas. And I mean, you think, oh man, you're going to see so much of Texas. No, we literally partied on sixth street every day. And then we were like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna come back to this place. I did not realize how much I was speaking it into existence. Um, Cause you know, pretty much later on, right after the, the, the coffee shop closed and I actually didn't get married to a particular person, I was in an engagement. I literally was like coin toss, flip coin. I'm gonna go to Nashville, Tennessee, or I'm gonna go to Austin, Texas. And that to this day, I laugh about that cause I could have a completely different life, you know? Yeah. Um, I think I chose the right city and I think even when I go to Houston or Dallas, I'm like, man, these cities are too big. Austin was perfect for me. For sure. For sure. Uh, cool. So first, I'd love to talk more about um, you know, what you've been able to do in real estate over the years. Uh, so can you talk us through your introduction to real estate and what the beginning looked like for you as far as in it being an investor? 
So of course, my family owns a lot of rentals in the federal Fort Bragg area. And it would be simple conversations where somebody go, hey, I want to sell this home. I don't want it anymore. It's like 30,000. The person go, well, okay. And that'd be my family, right? <laughs> so um, real estate's pivotal in many ways because all rules lead to real estate. I read that once and everything I've done in my life still points to that. So I was went downtown and it was the uh, tax, it was tax auction time, you know? Now tax auction time always happens in America, October, November, December. I have a whole theory why that is, but we'll talk about that another day. Um, and so I go down there and it's about six good old boys just hanging out, talking to each other in their 50s and 60s. And here I come walking, you know, coming on down there like, hey, this young kid's gonna buy some, you know, buy a tax lien, right? Um, and what was crazy is like this guy, I got it. I was like, cool. Well, then I got upset bid. And just a quick description of what an upset bid is, is someone who bids 5% or $750, whichever is greater, to upset your bid, right? And this guy did this back and forth with me for seven months. Because <laughs> it's like a three seven week, wow. yeah, it was like two to three week window where I had to respond or 14 business days. And then, and then I would respond. And then they would respond. And then and I was like, the deal wasn't even that good for him to be doing that. But I felt like he was purposely trying to be like, don't come down here. You know, they have their little group of people who buy things. Why are you down here? And that's why it led me to online. Because online tackling, you don't see nobody's face. Online, you can buy in Florida, you can buy anywhere, you can buy in Chicago. Anybody there see you in the face, see your personal, you know, who you are. Uh, and money's green, you know. So that was kind of my journey that started me in that. Further in my journey, I realized if I wanted to buy real estate in other cities and other towns, I'd have to get to know people and build up a foundation. So same thing with Detroit, uh, friend Asia, you know, wholesaler, construction, award-winning construction person um, up there in Detroit. That was helpful. You know, other cities, the same thing. You build a foundation of people who are well-known, well-liked, and have, you know, access to other people to work with. And that's kind of how the journey kicked off. For sure, for sure. Um, there's something we haven't had anyone talk too much about yet is uh, tax lien, like investing through tax mm -hmm. liens. Um, can you can you explain just like a, a overview of what that is for those who perhaps never heard of it before? Um, the quickest and simple answer is you have tax deeds and tax liens. Tax deeds mean you're buying the property. Tax liens mean you're buying the back taxes a person owes, right? So let's say your tax bill, and this is very common in the South, especially in South Carolina, tax bills are like 300 to 500 bucks. They're very low, right? But people get behind for whatever reason. And so all of a sudden you go down there, you purchase it. And, you know, for example, South Carolina, the first three months, they don't pay, you get 3%, right? 3% returns, right? Next, next three months, now you got 6% returns. Now let's say they don't pay for the whole year, you're at 12%. So a lot of times what happens is somebody, maybe something happened. And again, this plays into my theory about they have these tax lien and tax deed sales. October, November, December. What's going on in those months? Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Your mind is not on what is a income producing activity. You're in a consumer mindset. Most people are. And what ends up happening is now what happens when you need to pay your tax deed or tax lien, or because if it's a tax deed, you've already gone way past. Uh, you're at the option floor, right? Tax lien is a little bit different. As far as if, like, let's say you, you get your taxes back, your refund check in March, you're gonna run down there and go what? Pay your tax lien. And then me as a person gets the money and you get to keep your house, right? That's the simple version, that's the easy version. Um, that's how people get 18% returns in Florida. That's how people do a lot, right? Tax lien certificate in Alabama, if the house is vacant, I get the house immediately, right? But most people, that's the two terms they're hearing when they Google on the internet, tax lien and tax deeds. Got it, got it. So essentially, you know, you could potentially make money off the fact, like make money and interest off the fact that someone is behind on their taxes. Yep. Yep. Got it. And, and is there... some states are lower than others. Some states are higher, you know, but I, I personally like South Carolina and Florida. So. Got it. Got it. And is there a, is there a situation in which someone could get their property back? For sure. I mean, here's mm -hmm. the thing. If you're in Texas, let's say you go to the, you're, you're in tax deed state now. All of a sudden you're in Houston, they got you reading your stuff off on the courthouse, you, you owe 30,000 back in taxes, right? Well, you go down there, you're like, oh no, y'all. You go down there the very next day after it's done. You're gonna pay 25% interest. I'm gonna go ahead and give you what it is. If it's 30 grand, you was all behind on your taxes, times 25%. So now you gotta pay 37,000, 37, $37,500 to get your house what? 
officially back. So again, imagine if you were 100 grand behind on taxes. Do the math on that times 25 percent. Now you got to pay 125 thousand to get your house back from tax free sale. Does that make sense? That makes so sense. So a lot of people in Texas, if it's already gone that far, usually a lot of wholesalers make a lot of money calling you like, hey, hey. Do you want to sell before it goes too far? And it's that kind of, yeah. they play that game here. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so something else you mentioned as well is just the importance of like getting to know people in the States that you want to invest mm -hmm. in, you know, if you're investing long distance and you know, a lot of people are apprehensive about investing long distance for, for a myriad, for a myriad of reasons. So before we get into, you know, even more specific, could you explain um, how you were able to, cultivate relationships and meet the right people in the different states you invest in? So a big thing I tell people is compliment people. You know, every day when I get up, I have someone who checks my, my Instagram now. So, I mean, but I check it still. It's a hundred messages asking for something, asking for something, give me something, give me something. And when people make a compliment or they do a recommendation or something, I'm like, Oh, thank you. It stands out. So for me, what I would do is I'd spend a year, maybe a year and a half, just complimenting, liking people's posted pictures. Now, some people say, well, I need it faster than that, Erica. Well, I mean, if you want to go on someone's page and like 400 pictures in one week, yeah, you're going to be a stalker. They ain't going to work. For you. That's weird. <laughs> but if you kind of consistently like leave positive comments, um, like pictures, you know, spend money. I mean, anybody who's spent money, all the money I have that I've invested, 1.9 million I've invested has come from people who watch me on YouTube, right? So again, people have invested their time, invested their money built in relationships there. And that's the same thing I did. I would go online. I would go like a lot of their pictures, ask them questions, you know, pur purchase some time if I needed to a consult, whatnot. But overall, it's just cultivating relationships. Hey, I'm interested in this. I would love to come to your city. I'd love to visit you. See, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people can do all this from online, but I personally believe you need to go see a city. When I went and saw Cleveland, I was like, oh, oh my God. I'm thinking, you know, I'm on the plane panicking, like scared to get a rental car because they make it seem like it's going to be bone thugs and harmony. I get there, I'm <laughs> like, what is this little yellow little town? And I got a rental car and went on about my business. So um, I think it's important for you to visit the city so you see the benefits of it. Um, and you're also not disillusioned, right? Because people hear $40,000 house and they're from New York. They're like, that's a crack house, right? <laughs> like, right? Or if they're in California, they're like, what's happening? So I think that scares people um, and, and it's a win for people who live in outside states, right? If you live on the coast and you make good money, 40K is a win. Uh, but if you're in the South, people are like, well, I'm not, you know, I can't see it. I don't know. It's not right in my backyard. I think it's a proximity thing. People have to mentally get over it. For sure. For sure. So what was the first state that, um, that you ended up investing in? Other than North Carolina? North Carolina was the first. Uh, Detroit was the second. And I remember telling my cousin, oh, I bought a house in Detroit. Why would you do that? And it was just funny because I'm like, why do we buy houses here? Same reason for some money. Um, and then Cleveland and then Tennessee. And then I have something going on in Georgia right now. But my biggest project is here in Texas. Got it. Got it. So what, um, what made you go to Detroit? What made you buy a property there? Well, you know, you keep hearing all these stories and you're like, I need to see for myself. Well, I get there. And the first time I go there, my, t my Uber driver is giving me like the sob story of 1980s and like, yeah, you know, we thought the city was dead, but we're back, you know, and it was just funny. And so then I get to my hotel and I had amazing views of the water on one side and down Greek town. And I was like, this is a, a completely surprised me. Uh, and so I just was like, let me see more of the city. And so Asia gave me a wonderful tour and it's been a good friendship and business relationship ever since. For sure, for sure. Um, and then on that property, did you have to put any work into it? Was it? Oh, I ready? didn't put. I didn't put any work into it, but she did. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have like several. I had two properties that already had tenants in them, moving ready. Now here's yeah. the crazy part about that: they had some some lease fraud, right? Where they had these made up lease and made up payment statements. And so I was like complaining, and they're like, "Oh, this happens in Detroit sometimes." <laughs> I was like, "What?" Um, but the two of them already had tenants, already had leases. Um, a third just needed a little bit of shine. And then one was like really bad. It was water fire damage. And we didn't know the fire part till we got, start shingling some of that roof off. They're like, oh, this is what they were hiding. So it's just like, 
it's been interesting, but I think of it as a perspective of 88% of all people live within one hour of their mother. And this is according to the IRS. This isn't some made up state. This is like, they looking at your tax returns going, this man lived one hour within his mom, right? If you already know that about people, you know 88% of people will live within one hour of their mother, then you see why people stay in Cleveland, stay in Detroit, stay in Ohio, stay anywhere, right? Because they want to be close to family. And you get to kind of appreciate the real estate better that way. For sure, for sure. How did you, um, how did you handle the situation with the the tenants with the the lease, uh, the fake leases and stuff and payments? He was like, "Look, I don't know what my nephew did, but I can pay five fifty. I know somebody that gave me a piece of paper saying I'm paying seven twenty, but I seven fifty, but I've never paid that. And he could actually prove it. He was smart enough to keep his receipt." um out of that transaction but again you you just have to assess it there's really yeah. nothing can be done once you've purchased it you purchased it um you know if you want to be dramatic and put all the tenants out that day you could but at the end of the day you know he wanted to stay he was working we were like okay definitely for sure for sure so you have what is it four in detroit uh Longview, Green. yeah five now five okay mm-hmm. got it and do you partner with anyone on, on the deals you do? Do you go into them by yourself? Mostly partnerships. So I had this, I went to this conference one time and this guy talked about a hundred partnerships to 10 mil. And, and he had this whole thing he was talking about, but it, essentially he was like, you know, Zig Ziglar, if you help enough people get what they want, you get what you, get, you want, right? We all have either credit, cash, time or skill, right? And so I'm usually willing to give my time and my skill and a little bit of cash to make sure these deals go through. So some of the first ones that were like investment club deals, it was like five to 10 people on one house or one truck or one project. Now I'm more on the JV deal side, like me and one other person, right? Cause I can't control, you can be in your house right now. Four people can't even agree on what y'all want to eat for lunch after church. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. how do you think you're going to always have agreements when you have five or 10 people and stuff? And so I try to do JV deals where if somebody wants to purchase a truck, it's just me and that person. Or if they want to purchase a house, it's just me and that person. And I do all the management over here and the phone calls and the legwork kind of thing. So. Sounds good. Sounds good. I think, I think that's very valuable. And, you know, in our community, sometimes, well, a lot of times, we don't really trust each other or trust other people. We don't really want yeah. to work with other people. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you think we can move past that? So you got you to think about what people are dealing with. That's a scarcity mindset. Like I remember this woman, um, I remember this woman being like, man, I need, I want that person's life. And I'm like, but you have your own life. Like that's a scarcity mentality. And there is such a scarcity. Like I have to take this from somebody to win, right? Me win, you lose instead of a win, win. And when, unfortunately, like when people aren't making good income, it's a struggle. But I have a lot of middle-class black friends and they're in tech, they're doing different stuff. It ain't even a thing for them to partner with people 10K here, 20K here. But if you were to talk to somebody who was maybe an economic ladder shorter, they're like, well, if we can get 100 people to put $1,000 in, we will have this much. And I go, honey, I'd much rather you and your brother go get your credit cleaned up, save your money for six months, and then y'all come together. And once you show people you have results, you can bring all those other people with you. But to try to get 100 people to do, you know what I mean? It's like, Let's just focus on two people to make yeah. a deal work. And that's the problem. We have a lot of people who are like, but the big picture is the hundreds of people. And I'm like, I, I get you, boo-boo, but let's focus on just you <laughs> and your brother, like, or just another person. Um, you can go much farther that I think in my opinion. For sure. For sure. And then and then Cleveland, what um what got you interested in ex in expanding to that market? Um, actually after I visited, like for a while, they're like, oh, Cleveland, these cash flow, cash flow. And I'm like, uh, and then I get there and see they have engineering and bottle manufacturing and other stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. So my thought process of Ohio was like, it was a worse Detroit. I had it wrong. You know, like, um, Cleveland used to make fun of Detroit. Now Cleveland's like, Hey, I wish we speed up some of our recovery too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that kind of cemented it for me in the numbers. It was like a 40 K it's like a 30k deal we put 15 into it each top you know each part rents out for like 800 or something that effect or like 750 so it you know for 50k in yeah less than 50k in you got a pretty good return that's pretty solid is that one a multi-unit uh-huh multi-unit two unit got so it. it was just like oh, 
duplex. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. Now, are you still in um, North Carolina as well? North Carolina is more like stuff I have with my family, some nice. land that has trailers on it, that kind of combination of stuff. Um, here in Texas is I'm trying to get more land. I have a kid. I'm, do, I'm paying to make cold calls all day. Try to get me some land and uh, I'll put more projects out here in Texas. For sure. For sure. You mentioned um, in North Carolina, it's more so family. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. um, some people don't like working with family. Um, how, what's that been like for you? Well, here's the thing. So one of my, my sister has a truck under my authority. Um, I've had a cousin who I was willing to teach everything, step A through 10. And then he went and gave his money to some other man down the street and lost it and was like, come help me. And I'm like, no, honey, I tried to help you the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think your family will always, unfortunately, unless you have drastic change or move away from home, will always see you as that nine-year-old kid who was like, ah, I remember you were chubby and you did this and that. And they got all these stories, but they they can't put their new eyes on and see you as an adult who has lots of accomplishments. I mean, it was just last week when my cousin saw an ad from where on the internet for me and was like, oh my God. He was like, how do I start a business? And I was like, well, what kind of business do you want to start? And he had the most basic questions. I'm like, you're talking to someone who has multiple businesses and made millions of dollars. That is your cousin. And you have like, how much is the LLC question? That's crazy. You know? So yeah. it's tough working with family because of the perspective or how they see you. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. And yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Like sometimes they just see us a little kid and it's like, you could be doing great things, but they don't really see it as great things. They mm -hmm. see it. Some, some, some family, they, they see what you're doing, even though it's remarkable. They see it as like, Oh, that's, you know, his little hobby, especially if it's something that they don't, his or her hobby, especially if, oh. if it's something they don't understand, you know, I love saying your little business, how your little business doing yeah a million dollars that's how my little business <laughs> i used to be like a jerk sometimes at thanksgiving i'll probably do that again this year i'll be like just come in here with my fur coat on excuse me everybody <laughs> um i think I, I had a petty moment where i left a, a atm receipt down one time and my one of my cousins was like oh my god look at that right and it was just it was funny <laughs> but you can tell people people value uh money differently right one time we mm. had i bought like 300 dollars in crab legs or something and they were like, you got money like that? And I'm like, y'all, it's crab leg. It's $300. <laughs> it's something visual. It's something tangible. Yeah. Something like they wouldn't spend it, you know, kind of conversation. So yeah, it's pretty funny. For sure. For sure. And now, now Texas, it sounds like you got some cool things going Man. on in Texas. You know, I, there was a book called Rooted and I, I read that book like seven times. And uh, it was like growing in the places where God has you, right? You can't be two-footed. I can't be like, I'm in Texas, but I could go back to North Carolina. And I kept doing that for years. Like, well, if something would happen, if I had a surgery, I had two surgeries here, I would go home to North Carolina for a month. I would just be home with family. And they'd be like, either you're going to have to be here in Texas or go back to North Carolina. You have to pick. Um, you can't be of two minds, right? You can't be completely focused on the news in North Carolina and Texas. At the same time and so I kind of released about two years ago I really just made a mental judgment like stop like we're gonna put 10x into Texas and and the, and the deals and the opportunities have shown up so for sure for sure and, and you mentioned you just made a pretty large uh, land acquisition mm -hmm. uh, so can you can you yep. talk us through that so it's called Texas ground zero because I don't want y'all being worse or coming by my business <laughs> Good Texas idea. Ground Zero, <laughs> and uh, it's 18 acres. The first three acres in the front is a truck repair shop that just got expanded in size. So it went from four bays to seven bays. Uh, it's going to have a food court in the front part. You know, we're going to have like um, food trucks come out, very Austin type thing. Uh, in the back, probably going to have over 500 or 600 available parking spots for trucks, probably closer to 500. And then we're going to have a little future side motel on the left hand side of the property. So I'm super excited because, you know, I thought, man, it's going to take me a year or two to get all this like the way I want. And somebody called up the other day like, hey, we've got 1,500 loads of dirt. That would be enough to level the whole place. And just I would just make my parking lot, right? So yeah. it, opportunity moves fast. You just have to be in position. And, and the, the reason I even got the deal is someone who's watching my YouTube for years talked me up to these people and then was, and was like, I was like, hey, you want to be 10% of this deal? Yeah. I was like, how about 30%? And I mean, he's, he's the brains, he's the brains as far as construction goes. Cause for me, I'd be like, okay, sure. How, how, where, um, I'm more of a vision of like what I can see it could be, but that's yeah. incredible. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. so how does, um, how does a D 
deal of that size even work? Like as far as, um, you know, the due diligence, as far as like paying and all those things, like how, how did that work? It started with a rocket lawyer contract. And then I went to my attorney, they're like, man, you'll get this mess out of here. Uh, <laughs> it, it starts because you have to have, um, one, you have to be a good, a, a, not a necessarily a good person, but a person that has an ideal and can communicate with people. Communicating with people is the, is the number one part. Um, and, and those people were also given owner financing. So they wanted to pass it forward, right? This is kind of like their retirement plan, five-year payout. They're in their 60s and I'm just paying them out to their 70, right? Uh, <laughs> And for them, they're excited to finally see some things that they always wanted it to do become, right? When you're like, oh man, we're going to level this. And they start seeing it. You can see it in their eyes. Like, yeah, we had that ideal long ago, you know? And, I, and you just go, okay, because you, you can see it now. But uh, it's a big project. It's a, it's a heavy undertaking, but I'm pleasantly excited about it. Usually I'm, I'm hyped about it more than I am sad about it. Definitely, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think that's that's really cool. Uh, that's a lot. It's a lot of land for sure. Um, but it sounds like you have a pretty good team in place to just continue to help things progress um, and, and keep moving forward. Oh yeah, I mean, like right now, truck parking is so bad in Texas. Where we're at, it's like the last stop before you go stuck in Waco Temple traffic, or the last stop before you get stuck in Austin traffic for two or three hours. Like people. Don't understand if you're a truck going from here to San Antonio at five o'clock, you might get there at eight o'clock. It's that bad. <laughs> so traffic is bad. And this is before Apple finishes its store. This is where Tesla gets here. There's thousands of companies that have moved here, made the traffic really thick. And so providing this parking at where the location it is is really helpful. Wow. So it definitely sounds like perfect, perfect timing, perfect placement. And it's I mean it's filling a need, clearly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, and here's the thing, truckers want somewhere safe where they can eat food. That's not always McDonald's, right? So we're yeah. bringing in the food trucks to kind of mix it up. Uh, probably some you know, Mexican food, maybe some Indian food trailers visit. Indian food's very popular here because of the high, high number of people in the culture here. Um, I think of it as a retirement plan for myself even, because it's, I'm taking a business that made $1 million, very unorganized, very chaotic, probably gonna take it up to five or 10 mil why that number you're talking about you're adding parking you're adding services you're adding size there's a lot of moving parts you're adding to it that will grow it um from a low investment and it's like less than a it's like walking distance to the highway i can just walk to the highway and be right on the highway major highway of 35 so it's a pretty good deal wow that's perfect what i, what I like about that is there's like value adding multiple areas you know mm -hmm. you said you have like motel you'll have the food trucks You'll have the parking spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I don't even I don't know anything about trucking, but based on the little I do know, that can fulfill three needs that they have. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my uncles is a truck driver, so he's driving all over the country. Showers, yeah. And then like the right now, the government has a um, it's it's approved and it's heading to the Department of Transportation, um, where they're paying millions of dollars for truck parking because there's such a shortage. So many places have HOAs now saying you can't park the truck here. So you got a truck driver making six figures a year. He's got a nice house, but he can't park a truck at his nice house. You got to have it somewhere else. And so you're having a lot of that build up. You're having where people are not letting RVs or anything be parked in neighborhoods. So truck parking is a big, big need. It's very short, big shortage right now. Sure. And I, I think that just speaks to the, the fact that real estate can, you know, we have like the building, right? You have residential, but you know, you just talk through a million dollars, millions and millions of dollar potential income from the real estate in the form of land and everything you can put on it. So I think that's really, I think that's very cool. Um, awesome. Awesome. So I know you do real estate, but you also do a whole lot of other things. You're in trucking, you're into YouTube and, you know, I like to get into the real estate, but I also like to get into other entrepreneurial ventures that, guests have um and so i've watched like a bunch of your youtube videos Thanks. about just about everything uh, which i think is cool about businesses about just different things i i enjoy binging um binging sometimes uh so can you talk to us more about youtube and and how you got started on youtube and how you grew to become high earner on youtube as well mm -hmm. so i started youtube kind of uh i would talk to people and tell them about my family and they'd be like no way never heard of it <laughs> 
And so I started just documenting that and sharing those stories on YouTube. And it became a way for me to kind of like, hey, you know, and people be like, well, can I talk to you? And I'd be like, well, go ahead and put some, some coins there in the bucket and sure, right? And I started building that out and building that out. And it was just funny because it became a thing where I did 6,000 paid phone consultations. And when I hit the number, I was like, all right, guys, I don't care if I speak to another person. Like, that's my number, you know. Um, but after a while, you start to hear the same stories over and over. People's families not appreciating them. Wives, you know, somebody's wife got pregnant. They're like, I didn't realize how much we needed her income. And, you know, just the same stories over and over. And I got to help a lot of people not only, like, get better deals and get into real estate in other cities because I would be, like, a super connector. Mm -hmm. Like, I helped a guy in Miami connect with a guy and um not baltimore maryland but hagerstown maryland and buy up some property and it was like oh my god like it just i connected people and so the phone calls were great i mean it's been an interesting journey but literally sharing my journey with people every single dollar every single dime that i've used for my other businesses has has come from youtube right so really at one point the the painting company was paying my bills but youtube was like this surplus fund and so all of a sudden when I turned and said, Hey, you guys, I want to invest in this truck. Does anybody want to invest with me? Because people, I bring people on the show and they go, Oh, that person's cool and all, Erica, but I want to invest with you. Like, yeah, 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 that guy does, yeah, yeah, but I want to invest with you. And so I just started trying to make the avenue or the doorway for that to be possible. And it makes sense for both of us. For sure, for sure. Wow. So you went on YouTube just kind of sharing your story, mm -hmm. documenting the journey. Up. And it ended up bringing people who can who want to invest with you. You were able to connect other people to do their own investments and business deals. And of course, you're able to make some money in the process. That's the most important part. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so I started saying six figure YouTuber, and now it's been, of course, been more than that. But people can't wrap their head around that, right? Because if you say that 76% of Americans or about a hundred and some odd million Americans are making 30,000 a year, that's their, that's what they make. They're making two thousand five hundred a month. So when you start telling somebody you made twenty two thousand dollars last month off YouTube and it wasn't through AdSense, their brain is like, like what? And then you tell them you don't run no ads, you know. And so you you go, there's a way to run a business and there's a way not to run a business. And that's part of what I started teaching in my YouTube course is like, if you really wanted this to be a business, you interact with other YouTubers. Right now, my VA has scraped me a list of a thousand other trucking channels and a thousand, you know, financial channels and just start reaching out to those people. Like, hey, how are you doing? This is Erica, you know, um, because it's few people who are doing real YouTube numbers, right? Everybody thinks you're, oh, YouTube's full of millionaires. No, there's a ton of people who get like, I think 90% of all videos get less than a thousand views on YouTube. So if you're even a person that got over a thousand views, like consider yourself big time right because you are right. <laughs> and and then just reach out to people who are consistently working as hard as you are it, it's a plenty of them out there definitely definitely um and so could you give just like a short overview of how I mean, i'm sure you dive more into this in your course uh but just how people can monetize their youtube mm -hmm. well i mean it's just it's, it's every day if you think about every day here's what i tell people if you don't have an email list you don't have a business Right. I don't care if a hundred thousand people watch you. If YouTube pulls the plug and turns you off tomorrow and you can't email everybody say, Hey, I got kicked off YouTube. Did you have a business? No. So the first part is getting an email list. Why would they want to be on your email list? You'd have to be giving them something that you're not putting on YouTube, some kind of information, some data, some connection, some community that's not on YouTube. Um, there's a million ways to do it where there's pri private groups, mentorship, consulting, phone calls, courses, eBooks. I mean, it's the list can go on. Uh, what happens is a lot of people under, they cut themselves short in believing what's all out there for them to sell or do, right? We all have skills that people would love to pay for, majority of us. Definitely, I think that's key. I think that's key to the last thing you mentioned, mm -hmm. just the fact that everybody has something mm -hmm. that, that, that you know somebody else will pay for and you know, especially something that a knowledge or something that will make your life more convenient, you, you know, and so oh, on. For sure. Because the days of being cute on YouTube and you made a lot of money, that's over. Like there's, <laughs> there's a plenty of shirtless guys like showing you their biceps and that money isn't out there like that anymore for, yeah. for like silly season, you know, sure you get paid for views, but you're talking about, I mean, this guy was telling me, well, I want to make like eight grand a month off 
off YouTube. And I was like, well, you're going to have to get like 1.8 million views a month, get that kind of check. Or you could sell, you know, uh, let me make sure if I correct myself, sell $240 products, you know, it's yeah. just small. It's like the math has to change. You're not going to be out here looking cute no more. And that gets you just all the numbers and views. So, because people value their time. Video time is very important. The reason podcasts are blowing up right now, you can just have a podcast in the background, like you have Audible. It's in the background, it's playing. If you want to replay it, you can replay it. Right. YouTube is forcing you to have your visual eyes on somebody. So when I come on my channel, I used to make fun. This guy used to tell me, make sure you put lipstick on and make sure you do this and that because people are actually spending their actual time to look at you. So yeah. it's just comic courtesy, right? Kind of comic conversation. But that's the difference. It's a very powerful tool. People feel like they know you. I throw these events so people can come out and meet me. I'm like, come to my office, visit my office, come see how messy it is. Come see my staff, you know, come see me in person. I don't want you to think that I'm some stranger off the internet and you sent your money and now your money's in danger. Come visit us, you know? And yeah. that's kind of what I do all year long. For sure, for sure. Um, and then I also want to talk about trucking. How did you how did you get into that? Man, that's so crazy. Um <laughs> So I had been hanging out with these great ladies and gents named Kaki and Sandy from Hood Estates. Yeah. And what ended up happening is, you know, they had gave, I was an affiliate for them and they gave me access to the course. And I was, I was like, I'm gonna read it next week. I'm gonna look at it next week. I'm gonna look at it next week. And I was like, just going out living my life being busy. People would come up and be like, oh my gosh. And the prime example is where it hit me. I was at the Max Maxwell uh, pop out event in Houston, Texas. And this guy walks up and goes, oh my God. Erica Williams. And I was like, yeah, what's up, man? I just had to tell you, I watched that video. I bought the Hood Estates course. I went to my bank the next day, got $40,000 unsecured line of credit, bought a truck, then already had a driver in it ready to go, and it was in a week and a half. And this guy was, uh, he wasn't Nigerian, but I forgot which country he's from, but he was so adamant. I was like, and here I am with this course sitting, haven't read it yet, haven't looked at it, you know? Um, and I immediately went home and immediately looked at it, but I also became excited about trucking because I would get on the phone with people and, and dispatching and brokering and freight and all the, all the big, uh, measurements of control and they would be immigrants and they would kind of be like, Oh, I'm glad to hear American. And you're like, well, where are you? I'm in Pennsylvania. You're an American too. You know? And it's just funny because they're so used to dominating this area. I saw everybody but us buying. Right. So I kind of got on this train of like promoting that that really the power is in ownership. You know, you see drivers quit their job, like I'm gonna quit on you, right? And I go, yeah, you won the battle for today, but tomorrow you gotta go out and ask for another job. You know what I mean? You, you, yeah. gotta, you, you didn't win, that wasn't a win. I would go and see when I would purchase trucks, I see Indian men, I see, um, I thought these guys were black and they were like, no, we're Jamaican. I saw these other black guys they were like, no, we're from Antigua. And so you're seeing people of other countries tap into this billion dollar industry and what pushed it over the top for me was um, in two years, back to back, 15,000 Sikh Indians, two years in a row, had came to America to drive trucks. Now, if you know anything about their other Indian country counterparts, they're into the motel industry. They dominate the motel industry. If, even, if just every one of these 30,000 Sikh Indians buy one truck, that's 30,000 trucks in the marketplace. Let's say all of them buy two, that's 60 trucks in the marketplace. 60,000 trucks in the marketplace you will be out of a job like you could they can bring any people they can bring all of their family over to come work in trucking they would need you and so I, I started seeing where americans may be pushed out of certain certain businesses certain opportunities and i got more dug my heels in more for sure wow so what was uh so after kind of just realizing how much of an opportunity this could be um what were the early days like for you um just you know getting your first truck and Oh, and the headache, headache, you know, and what was funny is I would call places and they'd be like, uh, Mr. Eric Williams. I'm like, no, Erica, can I speak to your husband? Can I speak to the manager? Can I speak to the owner? I'm like, you're speaking to her. And then it'd be just a very off color joke sometimes where people be like, yeah, you lady owners are just coming out of nowhere. And, you know, it just, it's an industry that's been known to be a man dominated industry. And so you had a weird kind of first going I mean, even one time I was filling out this application for um, a loan for a truck and this guy goes, um, yeah, I hate to ask you, but I got to, do you have any back child support payments? I said, what? He was like, yeah, it's a question we have to answer all truckers. 
And so in my mind, immediately I go, you guys, they they have, they're so disrespectful <laughs> that they can ask those kind of questions on a financial loan document, right? Um, and what it made me see is like, when you don't own in a society, when you don't own, people can make rules over you that are offensive. That's just the, the nice way of saying it. When you don't own, people can do, right now in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the neighborhoods in Atlanta, Georgia, they already proved this guy's like a racist, he's in the Nazi party, and he owns 47 houses in one neighborhood, and it's a majority black neighborhood, uh, lower income. And people are like, oh, I'm so offended, but you don't own these houses. So you could be mad all you want, but guess what? All of these people still over there renting. He's still getting paid, you know? Um, and they made a big newspaper article on it. I'm like, what do you want people to do? If they don't own those houses, they can't do anything. Right. So ownership is a big play. And I keep wanting people like ringing the bell, like you need to own something. Yeah. <laughs> don't get stuck on that bottom rung, you know, move my cheese and be out there stuck. For sure. For sure. Wow. So, um, that's 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 pretty crazy. Definitely, I'm just yeah, I'm just blown away by that that story. Um, oh, when I would read, I'd be like, excuse me, like <laughs> yeah. just very craft nature, um, and cash advances are crazy. Like you know, truckers will complain about they're stuck at a company, they hate the company. You're like, what's happening? Or I never, they never have any money. A lot of times, guys get stuck and get taking cash advances, and so then they take so many that they're basically working for free. They're basically uh, working for. You know, they're working for their next week's paycheck, but really that next week's paycheck pays back their boss. And so you see stuff like that and you really get, like you gotta own people, you gotta have, you gotta have some credit cards, you gotta have some cash saved up, you gotta own. For sure, for sure. Uh, so after, I guess that rough beginning and some of those interactions, how has the trucking business been treating you since then? Well, it's a service business like any other, right? You yeah. have ups and downs. I had. At one point, I had four trucks all in the shop at one time. Right now, I have two coming out and one going in. And so it's like, you see the amount of money. What I try to get people to understand is 90% um, of all trucking companies have six trucks or less. 97.2% have 20 trucks or less. And there's a reason. They always make a joke. How you can either be super successful with one truck or 100. Everything in between is a mess. <laughs> well, it's a 20% margin. So the average six-unit uh, truck, six truck company had, makes about 1.5 mil. Out of 1.5 mil, 20%, which is the average net out of transportation, is 300,000 a year. Well, a guy who's making money, he's making 300,000 a year, he's the owner, he don't care about getting bigger. He's making 10X of what the average American is making. He's right. living a good life, right? And he can probably manage repairs in a, in with that, that few of trucks. Well, then you get to double that size, right? And honestly, any company that's over six trucks, you need to be focusing your attention and time to government contracting and dedicated routes. That's it. That's it. Like your company needs projections of how far in the future you're going to run. Period. Like if, if you know you have a $2 million dollar contract that goes over the next five years, great. You know you have a half a million dollar contract that goes for the next uh, 18 months, great. Now you can have projections. You can go to your bank and ask for money and, and be in a different position. And so it's like any other service business. I think people get excited by the big numbers, like, yeah, that truck made 10K this week. Yeah, but after you take out the driver pay and the fuel and the this, you really made two to 5,000. You made some money now. Don't get it twisted. But uh, people see those numbers and kind of get drunk off of them. For sure, for sure. So is the way it works, like, um, you'll have a truck on a route or bring a material somewhere and that party pays the company, which then pays the driver and then all the expenses for it. And then um, yeah, I mean, essentially, here's the thing. A lot of people use factoring. Like back in the day, people were like, oh, I ain't going to factor. They take in 3% of your money and, and, and only companies in debt take factoring. Well, that's, that's silly in old time. You can never believe that. Um, companies that don't factor essentially are saying, I'm going to wait 30 to 60 days for you to pay me. So for the next 30 days, I'm going to pay my driver out of pocket, his fuel, his gas, his everything out of my pocket. I don't know about you, but not many people have 30 to $50,000 to have five to six trucks running up and down the road with no factoring. So, <clears throat> so you have Loves, you have TA, and a lot of these places offering fuel cards, which is credit. People keep, that's credit. And then you have factoring, which will pay you the next day. That truck drops, you get paid that day, right? Uh, let's say that truck drops off at 11 a.m. You get the BOL, BOL from your driver, you take a picture of it, send it up to factoring, you get paid that afternoon. It can be that fast. 
And so what happens is <laughs> people, um, people get comfortable with, with, with certain flow of things. And this little headache that we had, which was a headache, was, was bad, but it was only companies that were over leveraged that were really struggling. The average guy or girl was like, well, I'll just drive more or I'll sit a truck or two out, lower my insurance. You know, there's all little different things you can do when you're actually running a business, when you actually know your numbers. And that's the difference. For sure, for sure. Um, and what's it been like for you as as a woman in the business? Like, are um, have have there been other women who just who see you doing what you're doing and have become inspired and want to get into the business as well? Um, it's a combination of people try to help you out, I think, because they're like, oh, look at this young lady. She don't know what she's doing. Let me help her, right? Um, but it's also like the men try to give me sob stories. So I just, I don't let them talk to me on the phone. They pretty much talk to the mechanic and then they got to talk to the logistics manager. By the time they talk to both of them, by the time they talk to me, it better be, your arm better be on fire. Right. And because what happens is they assume, Hey, it's a smaller company. I can kind of twin her, push her arm to give me a cash advance or hear my sob story about the truck. So, so it's an interesting position to be in. And I think any, anybody has, anybody can have an obstacle, right? Uh, their biggest obstacle for everybody is going to be money, cash and money, credit and money. Definitely, definitely. Um, something I meant to ask earlier, are you are you building a house? <laughs> so uh, I was in a contract with this company and I'm kind of taking them to court for breach of contract. So I'm looking for a new house, uh, mm -hmm. a golf, house on the golf course here. But like, I, like I've been telling people, like I, I went to 49 houses in a row and literally literally like whether they're leasing or for sale they're like boom gone 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 because i have a feeling that people are kind of preparing themselves two ways they're moving up as much as they can while they can be approved and they can get that home office and be out on the golf course and their kids can be at a nice little school and they ain't got to worry about it so what wrong is that crazy they can get stuff delivered to their nice area and stay there then you have people kind of moving down in income right like what's the cheapest rent i can get what's the cheapest place i can afford and you have two things happening in America right now that are causing housing to be like a free for all. Now, I will say I live in Austin, Texas, and I will tell people, I, I think in the next two to five years, we're going to be like California. I mean, we literally have 37 skyscrapers planned for downtown. We have wow. a domain size place planned for a huddle, Pflugerville, um, and downtown, right? So what is domain? It's a bunch of shops, it's shopping, it's hotels, it's high-end restaurants. It's very exclusive, the way the best way to say it. And like businesses and tech companies go to them because they know young people want to work, live in apartments and work there and walk around. And during this, the Rona and the riots, literally they had, you know, contractor security out there with like fake police lights going, like you will not come over here and tear this area up. This is an economic moat. Like this is a fortress of financial. And if you don't need to be over here, you don't need to be over here. So. Right. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so what, what would you say are um, some challenges you've experienced in the real estate space, in the trucking space that, um, or perhaps things you would have done differently um, if you could do them again? Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly. I, I would say always is going to be cash and credit and relationships, right? Uh, there's this one song, I can't remember if it was Goody Mob or something, One Monkey Don't Stop No Show or some crazy mess, right? Or something yeah. <laughs> old people say, one, one person don't stop no show. And you have to yeah. really get that in your mind. Like you will lose people along the way. You will have people, drivers you thought were great. They end up wigging out and now you got a firm. Um, you have to kind of have an overarching reason why you do what you do. Because if not, you'd be like, what's the point of this, right? If I didn't do A, I wouldn't be at B, which allowed me to now buy this place. Do you see what I'm saying? Like everything I believe, it, your steps are coordinated for a reason. They're not predetermined, but they're coordinated, right? Opportunities keep coming by your face. And if you, you mess up the first time, it's like the second time an opportunity come by, you, you might recognize it and jump on it. But at the third time, it, it might be behind you. That opportunity, now it's kicking you in the back and, you're, and it's laughing at you. Um, that's a paraphrase from Dame Dash. No joke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's, it's true. I meet people now who are in their 40s and 50s like, man, I would have did this or I would have did that. And, and it's like, you know, time, the time is either gone past you or you can make, you can determine, you know, what you're going to do with it. 
for sure for sure and i know you have like a ton of um courses and different opportunities for people to learn uh from what you do um so can you just talk through well the first question i have well i want to talk through that but first like what does the future look like what are your what are some of your plans um things you have coming up in, in i guess the rest of this year or in the years to come uh where where's erica williams heading Man, I plan on kind of building a, you know, this Texas Ground Zero is going to make a ton of money. And so it's probably going to pay for some of my other projects, which are just some, um, some, some more land. Like I want 40 acres and then my cousin's 40 acres and everybody's 40 acres. Right? I want yeah. more acreage, but I want to build uh, a couple three um, duplexes over there on this one area I'm thinking of. And then I want to put some trailers in another spot. Um, but overall, I'm going to take a really big break here. I've been going hard for five years. And now I have staff in every position. And once you start taking yourself out of the equation, like these businesses can run without me physically being present every day. Um, I'm making a lot of plans for vacation and little kiddos and, and a husband and all that good stuff. Right. You know, just like yeah. you're setting yourself on that track. So that's kind of what, what I'm looking forward to right now. But that's, I mean, like there's every day people that call me, like, Hey, I got this opportunity. Hey, I got this stuff. And discipline is knowing, knowing yourself enough to know when you have to say no. And hey, that would be great, but just not right now. Right. Definitely. Thanks for offer, but not right now. Definitely. For sure, for sure. Yes, that's uh that's inspirational right there. You know, really get into that uh business owner uh mindset where things can, you know, you don't have to be fully present. You just gotta make sure the wheels are continuing to turn. Um so as we as we close, I would love if you could talk through your courses and just different opportunities people have to uh, to learn from you, um, how they can reach you, and all that good stuff. Um, it, most people are going to find me on the Big Real Estate Life uh, website, or they'll find me at the ClassySCL.com site. And my courses are mostly the tax lien course, uh, Middleman to Millions, and I call it that because service businesses are low tech businesses. And you can pretty much start a lot of them and run them from your laptop, run your payment system and everything. Send a contractor in your place. It's a whole system. I've talked about it a lot over the years, but middleman to millions. Um, another big one is my YouTube course. I used to say YouTube for winners, but YouTube is experience YouTube <laughs> course. Um, those are the biggest ones I talk about right now recently. But there's a lot of opportunity for people to go on the site and see different stuff I offer. For sure, for sure. Wow, Erica, this has been a great interview. I think it's just um, very inspirational, you know, just you know, from the real estate perspective, the YouTube perspective, the trucking, I think it's just inspirational to see someone who looks like me, who looks like us, be able to succeed in all of those different arenas. And one of the themes that I picked up was partnership, you know, uh, especially in the real estate, the trucking, um, also with the YouTube, you mentioned that you're going to start partnering with even more um, creators within within your space. And you know, something I want the audience to drive home, just the fact that you can get a lot further with partnerships. And um, remember one thing you mentioned was that, you know, someone may have cash, someone may have credit, someone may have time. Um, so I think that's very important for everyone to think about um, when considering different different business ventures. But I know that uh, our listeners will learn a whole lot from this episode. So I really appreciate you coming on tonight. For sure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Definitely, definitely. And everyone, thank you for listening to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Look forward to talking to you all soon.